very much, first of all, to Gail and, and, and the uh, uh, Society for inviting me to talk. It's always a pleasure to come and talk about what we do in the Port Blantiquity Scheme. Hopefully it'll be of some relevance. And apologies if you're already familiar with the work that the scheme does, because it was difficult, in a way, to, to pitch this, I think, at the right level. But we'll, we'll plough on, nevertheless, and see. Hopefully we'll get somewhere. But I thought we'd start with um, a, a little bit of a brief history about the, the PAS, So because not everybody's familiar with how it sort of came into being. And by PAS, of course, I mean Portable Antiquity Scheme, or PAS, as some people call it. Lots of acronyms always in... In heritage, we love acronyms as everywhere else. Um, but the, 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 the scheme really sort of was born out of, if you like, the changes to the Treasure Act, which um, I'm sure Gail will, will cover uh, in a short while. But part of the, the new Treasure Act that came in in 1996 was that there was a recognition that although um, treasure was now protected to a, well, a better, greater degree than it was previous to that, the majority of archaeological uh, finds would still fall outside of that. Scope. I'm not going to go into details about what's covered by treasure, because again, I'm sure Gail will cover that. But th certainly a lot of those uh, ordi more ordinary finds, if you like, would, would fall outside that scope. So um, based on that, there was a, a discussion document, a consultation, as there always is, that suggested there should be a scheme uh, established to um, record these objects that, were, let's face it, were mostly being found by metal detectorists. And of course, there was this explosion in... Uh, the, the, the hobby, as metal detectorists call it, between the sort of 1970s, 80s and into the, into the 90s. So there were all this material uh, coming out, disappearing into private collections or being sold or going into drawers. And there was no archaeological record, if you like, of it. And so based on that consultation in 1997, um, the, uh, a pilot scheme was uh, launched. Um, in, well, in the counties you can see there, uh, Kent, Norfolk, Lynx, and I was reminded it was West Midlands as well uh, this morning. Um, and based on the success, uh, relative success of that pilot project in 2003, the, the scheme went nationwide. And what that meant was that uh, there were uh, people like me, uh, uh, finds liaison officers or flows, in, embedded in local authorities, uh, up and down uh, England and in Wales, or that's a slightly different case, but certainly in England. Some of them, uh, some of my colleagues are based in museums, uh, some are based in archaeology sections, as, as I am. Um, but the idea is that we are there as a point of contact for local people, for people that live in those areas, to bring their finds to and have them identified and, more importantly, um, placed on our database, our publicly accessible database. Um, there are, well, in our current strategy documents, we have sort of five strategic uh, goals, if you like. Um, the, the, the headline, which we'll come back to again and again, is to advance archaeological knowledge. Um, that's what we're all about, I mean, that's why we're all here, really. Um, but that's the sort of the, the headline goal. And, and, tell, and this, yeah, tell the stories of past peoples and places where they live. And again, that comes back to how the, the PAS is embedded within local communities, in local, um, in the local authorities. Um, and we want to share that knowledge through our database, through the other work that we do, so that people can learn about the past uh, and archaeology in their area. We also want to promote best practice by finders. Often this is the most sort of uh, tricky area, if you like. Um, by promoting best practice, it means working with uh, the public, mostly with uh, metal detectorists, and encouraging them that, that recording their, their ordinary finds that don't qualify as treasure um, the recording them to voluntarily recording them is of benefit and, and explaining those benefits to them and explaining about you know local heritage and, and, and what we can do for their finds and what we can do with that information. Um, importantly for today I guess one of our goals is to support museum acquisition of archaeological finds so that they're saved as we do in museums they're saved for the future and for uh, people in again in local communities um, and that would include obviously treasure but also ways in which we might sort of um, explore ways of acquiring other uh, uh, non-treasure finds as well and I'll come on to that a little bit later um, what we really need to do at the moment and this is very important as well is to provide the PAS with long-term sustainability at the moment it's a bit of a wing and a prayer um, and a lot of goodwill by local partners in, in local authorities that help support the flows. Um, and it's, it's a difficult, as in all of our uh, situations, I'm sure it's a difficult financial situation. So um, we need to focus on that as well. Um, just to give you an idea, of, again, of how the scheme works, I've talked about sort of how we're embedded in local authorities. 
The scheme overall, if you like, the scheme is funded uh, through DCMS, the Department for Culture, or Digital Department, as well, is it now? Department of Digital, Digital. Culture, Media and Sport, um, who of course uh, have a settlement for the British Museum. The British Museum in turn funds the uh, PAS. Um, the PAS then give a grant, if you like, to, uh, in my case, a Durham County Council or to the local authority, who then um, hopefully at the end of every month pay me. Um, see how it goes today, shall we? But um, um, Finds Liaison Officers, essentially our main duties are to uh, take in those objects that I've talked a little bit about, record them on our publicly accessible database, um, and then at the end of that process, return them to the finder. The recording process essentially is taking good photographs, such as those you can see above there, um, and full description and, and hopefully an identification, although some of them are unknown objects. Um, and then, at the, like I say, at the end of that, we return them to the finder, usually. Um, we also facilitate uh, the reporting process of artifacts that qualify as treasure. We don't have an official role in that, but, um, or, or a legislative role anyway, but coroners certainly prefer that they come through, um, through the flows because obviously we can identify them and say, with the help of colleagues and the, and the treasure team in London, we can say, yes, it's treasure or, or no, it's not. You know? So that helps the coroners immensely. And then, of course, we assist the museums in acquiring those objects. And again, I'll come on to that in a little. Well, I think you'll probably cover that, won't you? So I'll not come on to that at all. Um, but what we really want to do is, is, is build relationships as well. We've got the finds, reporting, recording, database side of things. But what we also want to do is build relationships. We want to try and, if we can, help to use the cliche, help bridge that gap between uh, professional and public archaeologies. And we do that through outreach and engagement and through lots of activities. Um, as a scheme and as individuals. Um, just a qu very quick slide about treasure. Um, but, of course, when we do facilitate that, that, um, that, uh, that reporting of treasure, um, museums obviously can acquire these treasure finds. They have the opportunity to do that. Their value is recommended by the Treasure Valuation Committee. But finds that aren't acquired by museums, treasure finds that aren't acquired, end up being returned, usually returned to the finder or, or landowner. Um, and as I say, that, the, the headline really of all that we do really is to advance archaeological knowledge. And so within that, it's important to establish the, the sorts of things that we, we will record, the finds and artifacts that we do take in uh, and those that we don't. And I've put everything with an asterisk, uh, mostly because finders, and, and you find this time and time again with detectorists, they'll say, oh, well, you wouldn't want to see this. I've got, these, I've got this rubbish box of all the stuff that, you know, is not particularly interesting. I've got this lovely gold coin, I'm sure you want to see that, but you wouldn't want to see these, you know, my collection of 500 spindle worlds, you know. But, the, but we do want to see the collection of 500 spindle worlds, probably more than the gold coin, really. Um, because, it, you know, as you know, it's all about collecting that data and, and where you've got, and this is the great thing about the database that, you know, I heard um, one of my colleagues, Sam Moorhead, say, uh, no, it's Kevin Leahy, sorry, say at a conference recently, is that now we're, the database has grown so large, we're almost at 1.5 million artifacts, that we can ask those big data kind of questions, not just the individual little studies, but those big data questions, and that's fantastic. But we can only do that if we've got those 200 spindle worlds on the record as well. So when I talk to finders and they say, oh, you want to see this, you know, but I say, yes, we do. We want you to bring along everything that you've got, if you like, and we'll go through it together. And that's what a lot of the finders who come in to see me do. They'll, they'll bring a lot, you know, they'll show me the lovely, you know, coins and, and brooches and things that they've found. Well, they'll say, oh, I've got this as well, you know. And then we'll go through it piece by piece, pull out the things that we think may be interesting to record, and obviously, you know, not record the Victorian pennies, unless we become the Victorian penny recording scheme. But um, the, the important point is that, you know, we, we need to see these artifacts because, you know, we're we're the best place to identify what the recording priorities might be, where the gaps are in our knowledge, and what's important for our local area as well. And flows will, you know, take us particular interest in their area in perhaps, you know, I, I quite like it when mining things come in, you know, tub tokens and things like that, um, which finders don't think are of any value. But I think those things for County Durham, heritage and history, local stories, local communities, again, are important to record, particularly as that knowledge is now disappearing, you know. But there we are. So everything but... You know, not everything. Um, in terms of what, um, what I'm here to talk about, in fact, uh, museums and, and, and the jobs that you guys are doing, um, I've 
to call this slow, getting to know your flow, which I think is very important, um, where you can perhaps help us a little bit or where we can help you as well. Uh, I'm sure you all get lots of inquiries at your museums, people phoning up saying, I found this thing in my garden, you know, fits in the palm of your hand. Um, what, what we can do, um, and it says there, so we, we record, when I say everything, we record all objects, certainly all objects up into the sort of the 18th century, um, provided that the finders know where they came from. And this is the key thing, it's got to have a location. The only context, if you like, really, that these topsoil finds have is that location, that specific location. We prefer to have a very precise location, uh, ideally like a 10-figure grid reference. It gives us the square metre, at least, it came from. We will accept a sort of a six-figure grid reference, which is more about the field uh, that, it, that it came from. But we must have a, a location. And we'll record, you know, whether it's sort of lithics uh, or stone objects, pottery, obviously metal objects, which is the 90-something percent uh, of the objects that we record because of metal detectorists, and worked stone as well. And key that it's portable as well, portable antiquity scheme. So the gentleman that phoned me up to say he discovered on LIDAR a Roman fort, uh, I said, well, can you, can you bring it in? And he said, no. I said, well, perhaps you need to talk to the ATR then. But um, um, what we don't do, and this is very important as well, is we don't do valuations on objects ever, really, partly because I wouldn't have a clue uh, how much a lot of it's worth. Um, we, we don't really even direct people to where they can get their, their valuations. I don't think that's the business that really that, that we're in. Um, so we don't do that. Um, we obviously wouldn't deal with excavated or archaeologically excavated objects. If people are bringing us archaeologically excavated objects, then something's gone very badly wrong somewhere along the line. Um, obviously, we won't do heirlooms either, um, unless they're archaeological. You never know. I had a finder, or a, a granddaughter of a finder, if you like, um, come and see me a few weeks ago, and her, her grandfather in Gloucestershire had dug up a, about seven or eight sort of small Roman coins in his garden over a period of about you know, 40 or 50 years. So, and he'd given them to her, you know. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's an heirloom of a sort, but obviously it's an archeological um, heirloom, so we'd record that. And no fossils, and no meteorites, please. And I do, on a regular basis, have people bringing me in fossils and, and meteorites, which I then direct them to Durham University, uh, to the geologists. <laughs> um, if you do take inquiries from people and you want to direct them to us, and I would encourage you to do so, then um, all of the contacts for your, if you don't know your local flow, you should get to know your flow, but if you don't know them, um, all our details are listed uh, on, our, uh, on the, on the Portable Antiquities Scheme website, finds.org.uk, uh, under the contacts uh, page there. Um, so uh, you, you can find that there. Uh, um, if it's appropriate, if you think that perhaps in, in this case you, you get the feeling that you do sometimes, this person's just going to hang up and not bother, but you think you can get their contact details and you think that the information that they have or the find that they have is, is, it would be important to record, then if you can get their information, it's possibly a fine spot and, and, and then give your, give your flow a ring and, and do it that way, then by all means do that as well. Um, um, the other thing that's helpful to, to us um, as flows is to know the, the, the museums within our area, what their collection policies or collection policy is. Um, if you have particular uh, areas or periods of, of interest for your museum or your collection, um, let us know because things may not just treasure things, but other things may, you know, often people want to donate things and we're not maybe not sure where to, to send them. Um, so you let us know what, what your interests are. Um, have you handled these donations as well as often? So, I, so the, actually, this is a good case. So this, this statue of Fortuna here was recorded, found um, uh, not too far away from a Roman fort in, in County Durham in farmland. It's only about that big, but really, uh, you know, a lovely little statue. The finder has, uh, you know, has worked with the PAS for many years, but he was quite keen at, at the start anyway on that it should be in a museum. He recognised that it was, you know, a really nice find. Um, and he asked about the possibility of if he could long-term loan it to uh, a museum rather than donate it outright. And of course, I know that there are obviously huge problems with these kind of long-term um, loans. Um, so it, it, if you can let us know what your policies are in, in terms of that in advance, then we can say, rather than say, oh, I'll find out for you, we can you know, let finders know. In the end, it hasn't yet gone to a museum. He decided he wanted to keep it on his mantelpiece for a bit longer, but I believe he's in discussions with another museum now about them possibly buying it from him. So it may end up in a museum at some point. Um, 
What can the PAS do for your museum? Um, well, as I say, you know, leading on from that figurine, hopefully we can help you expand and, and grow your collections. You know, we, we see a lot of finds and a lot of nice, you know, there's really lovely things. And then there's, you know, the more kind of workaday objects as well that come through. But, um, and again, if we know what it is that you're interested in, we can help. And I've got a little case study from Durham. Uh, um, and this was dealt with by my predecessor, actually. Um, I sort of came in, or began this, came flow at the tail end of this. Um, but the, this was a, a really fantastic find of a copper alloy uh, diploma um, that was found not far from Lanchester Roman Fort in County Durham. Uh, the finder was a, a local guy, very keen that it should go to a museum. And so my, my predecessor sort of acted as a liaison facilitator uh, and, and sort of put him in touch with the museum. And in the end, the museum purchased it and it's now, it's now on display. And I'd encourage you all to go and see it if you're ever in Durham. It's a fantastic object. And it's now on display in, in uh, the Archaeology Museum, the Durham, Arche Durham University Archaeology Museum on Palace Green in, in Durham. Um, speed up a bit, I think. Um, in terms of outreach, um, you know, we'd hope that we could help you increase your visitor numbers and get people through the doors. And we do all sorts of events with you. You know, we can do finds days. I do a finds. I've started since I took the role. I noticed that the, I wasn't getting a lot of finders coming in from the southern part of the region that I cover down sort of in Teesside. So now on a quarterly basis, I go down to Kirk Leatham Museum on a Saturday, because they insisted it had to be a Saturday, but I go down there and, and, and that's brought, uh, I would guess, probably 30 new finders or people returning to the scheme, to uh, metal detectorists to record their finds with the scheme. So that's been really successful. So we, we can do things like that. We can just come and do an, an afternoon of, you know, uh, sort of finds handling and things like that. Most flows will have a reasonably decent sort of handling collection. Um, we can contribute to displays and exhibitions. Um, we, the, again, this is Durham University Archaeology Museum. We, I, I did an exhibition with them a couple of years ago, celebrating 20 years of the, of the scheme. Um, and you can see one of, the, one of my finders who's recorded for many years, keeps all these finds. So you can't wince at the foam in there. He was advised by, uh, Gemma, that he, uh, by Gemma Lewis at the museum that he should perhaps think about his packing materials. But he bought in these big cases, you know, and we thought, well, this is a really lovely way to display them, um, you know, as the way that he curates his collection. So, you know, we put them on display and finders loaned um, objects, their, their favourite objects and things. And that was a really nice um, exhibition. I was trying to dig out the visitor numbers and I couldn't find them. So I shall have to find that out for the next talk. But it was a really, you know, really uh, nice exhibition, nice to be involved in. So we can do that as well. We can obviously give you a, uh, advice, if you like, on uh, uh, treasure case, on the treasure cases. And of course, as we discussed earlier on other finds or objects that you may have in your collections that you want sort of help identifying or, you know. Um, and also we can hopefully help improve knowledge of your, um, of, of small finds as well. So this is in reach rather than outreach. I don't know if that's a thing, but, um, or PAS as CPD. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we, there's some fantastic sort of guides and, and resources on our, uh, on our website. This is the sort of the landing page for the, for the guides. Um, under the counties tab, but there's some really, really great sort of guides. And they, uh, there's been a, um, a project running for the past few years, what's called the Past Explorers Project within the PAS that was um, an HLF funded project, uh, specifically aimed at sort of volunteering and, and, and uh, making resource, these kind of resources available as well. So there's lots and lots of new guides that are being added all the time um, at the moment. Um, did I not skip a slide there? No. Um, which is, you know, great. Um, so I encourage you to use those, those guides and to use the database itself as well to search objects. Uh, if you haven't looked at our website, then please go and have a look. You can register for an account, which, um, and even if you're doing a specific research uh, in, in, into an area, um, you can register for a higher level account as well, which will give you sort of greater access to find spots and things like that, which may help with your research. Um, but as you can see, there's all sorts of searches you can do on there. And as well, if you register, you can save those searches. You can save um, sort of the information that you find so you can refer back to it later. And it's just a, an example of, you know, if you type in Roman brooch, this is the kind of search results you'll get. Lots and lots and lots of Roman brooches throughout the country. Um, uh, oh, the slides are out of order. That's what's happened. So I was talking about the guides before. These are the examples from uh, some of those guides. Um, so there's a really good uh, guide on brooches, as you can see there um, in the top, and, and that will sort of give you an introduction right through from the kind of earliest Iron Age brooches right through to kind of medieval brooches, and we'll you know, have big features on things like the cruciform brooch here, um, the various motifs that you'll find on, um, on saucer brooches and helping you to date them and things like that. 
So they really are, uh, you know, really great guides. And of course, they give you um, links to other reference or key texts and reference material as well. So they're a really good place to start. Um, in terms of using our data and, and searching and uh, our data and, and using it for research or for comparanda and things like that, there's a really great publication that's available on the website as well that was, um, I think, it's about four or five years old now, but a guide for researchers. And why this is uh, really good is because it gives you an idea of the, the biases that are in our data as well. Obviously, it's, it, because there's this collection bias and, and detectorists are drawn to particular areas for one reason or another, it means that you, know, you, you need to understand those biases and understand how that data is being compiled before or at the starting point of your research, really, to put that research in context. So, again, it, that's a really good um, tool if you were thinking of doing any research using this. Um, and now, as a selfish bit, what you can do for us, um, once you've acquired objects, um, and I was going to actually mention uh, before about um, when I was talking about the figurine, um, you know, we can help with um, if there, when there are particular objects that you or, or gaps in your collection that you want to fill and you think that we can help fill those with, you know, by purchasing objects. There's a, um, or, or even just sort of encouraging donations as well. Adam Parker, who's kind of a part time ish flow and also works for Yorkshire Museum. Um, he's sort of working at the moment on, on various working on finders, literally, to donate objects to the scheme. And that's, oh, sorry, to the museum. And that's been uh, quite successful. He's had quite a number of objects um, donated. Um, so if you think we could help with that as well, uh, let us know. Um, but when you have acquired those objects, it's really useful for us if you can let us know what, the, whether it's a treasure or just a, a, a different object. If you can let us know the accession number, we can add that to our database as well so that the information is all stored there. And if someone was particularly interested in that object, they know where to go to, to view it in the future. Um, one thing that um, Gemma Lewis, again at Durham, has done really successfully is that when objects have been acquired, and whether it's you know, through treasure or not, she's invited the finders to come and see the displays, or if it's not going on display straight away, just to come in and, and, and to see the museum, have a guided tour, to see what's going to happen to their object. Um, and, and often that's quite, um, well, it's quite an important part, really. The, the, whatever your views on metal detecting and, and that kind of collection process, um, the, 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 when they find these objects, as we all do, the, they'll build up quite a close relationship you know, with, the, with the objects. And, and, and when they then do decide to part with them, or have to part with them due to treasure, um, it, they often feel like they almost get to you know, have to give them away without saying goodbye. And I think, in some ways, it, it, it's nice for the finders to come in and sort of be able to ha perhaps handle the object again, and to see that it's being cared for, and, and, and also to feel that they've done the right thing, you know, that the right thing is being done. Um, and I think that, you know, it is really important. Um, and of course, informing them about any exhibitions that the object may be featured in, or any you know, media or, or blog posts or anything like that, that, that may result from it. And let us know about that as well. Um, more generally, um, spread the word. Uh, refer finders and, and people who are interested in the scheme, um, whether, that, whether that is finders, whether it's researchers. You know, make them aware of the data that's there that, you know, that can be used. Um, and just let us know what you're up to, really. Um, obviously, I crossed out cakes. You don't have to do that. But you know, if you want to send your flow cake, I'll never turn it down. Um, and just, yeah, that's about right. And just very lastly, about social media and, and blogs. I mean, I'm sure you all um, have to write blog posts and, and um, you know, do the social media thing. We obviously do it as well. Um, there are obviously the main accounts for Portable Antiquities on, on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, we also have uh, local blogs, um, so each county or each region will have a, a local area blog that we're supposed to fill in reasonably regularly, um, which will talk about you know, activities perhaps that are going on in that area, finds days, you might talk about particularly nice finds that have come through. Um, if you, you're welcome to share those, but likewise, if you've got things that you think pertain uh, to the work that we're doing and you let us know about those, we can always retweet or reblog or whatever it is you do on Instagram that's similar. Um, so please, you know, let us know what you're up to and, and keep in touch. Um, and that, I think, is about it.